So again, keep in mind that the popular front was primarily made up of these Kulobis. Uh, many of them had a criminal past. They were fighters. They were often accused of abuses during the war. Now, the Lenina bodies actually empowered the Kulobis. They needed them for manpower for the fight and to take the fight into a different region, to the south. So they were, the, the Leninabods were giving guns to their junior partners, the Kulobis, with the hope that they could then later rein them in and end the alliance when the opposition had been neutralized. But as they were doing this, the Kulobis grew more and more powerful, and they grew too strong. They were the ones with the arms, and they were also directly supported by Russia. So they became a new force in the Republic. They really grew out of, out of control of the Leninabods. Now, in reaction to the Popular Front, there arose a, a, a number of opposition-based self-defense units all around the country that were sprouting up all over. In oh, here we go. Oh, let me find a, a map for you. Um, in in Kurgon Tepe over here, for example, uh, around Ram. Uh, where is Ram? Oh, I lost Ram. It's not on this map. Uh, well, okay, the, just trust me, around, uh, so, uh, and also in Badakhshan, um, in, in, in the eastern area, um, Harm is somewhere in this area, but I'm missing it, um, on this map, but so all these self-defense units arise all over the place, and it becomes easy uh, for them to, to rise up and try to confront this. Now, um, one of the problems that the opposition had is that they took on this divisive tactic as well, and they began to preach these anti kulob science uh, uh, slogans. And this actually just mobilized the Kulobs even further in this area. Um, the Popular Front at the time brutally suppressed the people, anyone who was believed to be uh, a sympathizer to the opposition. And they began to uh, focus on ethnic lines. So people of Harmi or Badakhshoni descent were assumed to be sympathizers. And again, so this is a political battle but now it's, it's spilled into clan and ethnic lines. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that the opposition was engaging in lots of unsavory tactics as well, kidnappings, hostage taking, and that sort of thing. So, fighting goes on throughout the spring and summer, and it leads to major refugee movements, uh, especially the, the anti kulobi push, which leads to uh, a movement into, into Dushanbe. And by now, as I mentioned, this has slipped really into clan warfare. It's the Kulobis versus the Pamiris in the, in the mountains and the Harmis, um, who are or in further west. Um, in September of 1992, the oppositionists actually capture President Nabiev, and they force him at gunpoint to resign, saying that he hasn't given enough of a role for the opposition in his, in his government uh, of reconciliation. So the government, in turn, installs a Badakhshoni as the acting prime minister, perhaps as a gesture of compromise. Now, at this point, if the Leninabad and the Kulab people had any sympathies to the government before, they're all gone now. The government of national reconciliation was really too weak to maintain any semblance of control. And in November of 1992, ex-communists surround Dushanbe and force the government to resign. Then they and their supporters set up their own meeting in the capital of Leninabad, and they establish a new government without the opposition that's headed by uh, Imam, Imam, <clears throat> sorry, Imam Ali Rachmanov. And these were people from Kulob and Lenin, Leninabad. Now, by now, there's a major strain between the Leninabad and the Kulobs. So they've come together and they've put these people in power, but there are major strains because the Kulobis allied with the Leninabads, but when they won the fighting, the Kulabis, who did the fighting, ensured key spots for themselves. And in doing so, they actually alienated the Leninabads, who had historically governed. So the Kulabis' popular front became a government fighting force in the interior ministry. And in fact, the government military by 1993 was really composed of Kulabi units only. So they've become the, 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 the key power source within the state. In large part, the Kulabis, who came to power in November of 1992, created an environment of fear. There were rumors going around that there were unofficial prisons that were operating. Um, the, the media became much more cautious, much, much more um, self-censoring. The judiciary, the same thing. The opposition was banned, and the regime held very tight control over the media. 
in the name of security, but they were consolidating power. And this alienation led to efforts by the Leninabads to even secede from Tajikistan in 1993 in the form of an economic free zone. And they did receive significant sovereignty as a result of government weakness. The government was still very weak under the Kulobs. Now, Rachmanov was formally elected uh, with 60% of the vote in November of 1994. These were unfair elections, very characteristic of Central Asia. So right after the Civil War, technically in the middle of the Civil War, but things had calmed down to a certain degree, uh, they slipped into the, the, the normal Central Asian uh, path, which was rigged elections, uh, media bias. They, they were certainly not free. The opposition wasn't allowed to contest them. Um, he's actually been reelected three more times since then, uh, each another seven-year term. So he's still in power today. The most recent time was uh, actually just this past fall, or I should say fall of 2013. So note here that during the 1994 elections, Russian peacekeepers actually endorsed Rachmanov, and they provided billions of rubles, the Russian currency, to bolster his public image by paying state employees, for example, months of back salaries, um, which made him much more popular. So the Russians were already actively taking a part in this, uh, not only as peacekeepers, but also in the political process. And this is also when the Constitution was voted on in the referendum, the one referendum that we had in Central Asia. Remember when we talked about this? Um, this was actually mandated in the peace process, that they would have this referendum. And all this occurred during a state of emergency. So, again, it's, it's, it's important to remember that, that the Constitution was really born within, before the Civil War even technically ended. In 1995, you've got parliamentary elections, which are also characterized by fraud and intim intimidation, highly restrictive. Rachmanov essentially determined who would be in parliament. But even the Kulubis were divided. Rachmanov appointed most uh, of his ministers in, 19, in his 1995 cabinet from his local faction in Kulub, which actually had the effect of splitting the Kulubis. So this is a picture of early democratization in Tajikistan. And this is why I keep talking about how the Tajik experience is very specific. So let's talk about the international dimensions, international intervention. Would Tajikistan have erupted into full-scale civil war, as opposed to, to low-intensity conflict, if the Russians and Uzbeks hadn't intervened after November 1992? And we'll talk about how they intervened. Well, uh, looking at the map, who would care about Tajikistan? And so the, the big party, obviously... Um, he, well, Afghanistan's not going to care. China, this is this is a sparsely populated area in China. They're not going to care. Um, it's going to be the Uzbeks, the Kyrgyz, who are much. Uh, the Uzbeks are a much more populous country, um, and then and then the Russians, who are the sort of regional power. So remember, for Uzbekistan, Leninabad was thirty percent Uzbek, and the Leninabad clan owed legitimacy to Soviet rule. It was tightly tied to the Communist Party as were all the Uzbeks. So opposition attacks on the communists were, op were, op were really attacks on this clan. The Kurgan steppe was also made up of 32%, about one-third Uzbek. There was a long-standing Uzbek-Tajik rivalry that was fueled by Uzbeks getting into, uh, by Uzbekistan getting those two Tajik cities, Samarkand and Bukhara. This had been rarely felt at the top where political elites were from a common international party, again, Homo Sovieticus, um, they sometimes had Uzbek roots because the Uzbeks had a say in choosing who would be, um, who would reside in power structures within Tajikistan during the Soviet Union. But if nationalists and Democrats came to power, Uzbeks feared that this status quo would change and their territorial integrity might even be challenged. In other words, the civil war would spill over and they would try to take back parts of Uzbekistan. Now for Russia, intervention in Tajikistan also fit well with a general Russian foreign policy, which aimed at stymieing emigration uh, to Russia from what they called the near abroad, Central Asia, other, other post-Soviet, uh, now independent countries. They wanted to maintain Russia's stability, uh, the, st the stability of Russia's borders, and therefore Russian stability. They wanted to guarantee interests of Russians, ethnic Russians in post-Soviet states. This policy was strengthened with the 1993 elections in Russia that brought Vladimir Zhirinovsky significant results in Moscow. It became one of the largest parties, um, a, an ultra-nationalist party. In a sense, the Russian minority was also a justifying factor, the Russian minority in Tajikistan. 
was a justifying factor for a policy which kept Tajikistan in Russia's sphere of influence and became a cornerstone of Russia's sphere of influence within Central Asia at a period when Russia was declining in influence. Tajikistan was regarded in many ways as a piece of Russia still back then. Now, in fact, the opposition made special appeals to Russians to try to get them on their side. They promised the minority guarantees in the face of Islamic symbolism. Even though Uzbeks and Russians were unhappy with certain cultural programs of the opposition, like the Tajik language issue, the opposition at least tried to keep Russians uh, they, they tried to keep Russians safe, the ethnic Russians, um, in, in order to say that they, they weren't these xenophobic nationalists that, um, that the Kulabis and Leninabads were saying they were. So, so they were trying to keep them on their side. The Islamic factor clearly came out, though. There was, there was a very clear fear of Islam, which was convenient for Russia, and convenient for Uzbekistan, convenient for Russia, because at the time, Russia was also, remember, fighting its own civil war, essentially, within Chechnya, southern Russia, um, between Islamists in Chechnya and, and uh, Russia. Uh, and U Uzbekistan was also facing its own sort of opposition uh, that it, it claimed was based on Islamists. So Uzbekistan was easily brought into the war based on appeals from their brethren who were fighting, quote-unquote, Islamic fundamentalists down south in Tajikistan. They were the same guys that who that wanted to get Karimov back in Uzbekistan proper as well, at least Karimov said. And so he had a role, he had a reason to get involved. All in all, though, the Islamosphere was almost definitely overblown. Um, it may have been real for Russia. It may have been real for Uzbekistan and other Central Asian states. Um, remember, Russia had just left Afghanistan a couple years ago. But it appears that there wasn't really a, a real Islamist threat coming out of Tajikistan. So looking at the extent of cooperation, the opposition was organizing and actually launching attacks from abroad. Um, Russia, where, secular, where there were secular leaders, and Afghanistan, where they had fighters. Um, and they were also launching attacks from the mountainous parts of Tajikistan, Gornobadakshan. The Popular Front even trained on Uzbek territory and launched attacks from Uzbekistan. So both sides were, were using foreign borders as ways to... Um, strategically enhance their own side. More directly, though, the Russian 201st uh, Motorized Rifle Division supported the Communist Party remnants militarily, as did Uzbekistan, which bombed opposition strongholds. This unit, this Russian 201st Motorized Rifle Division, became the core of the Commonwealth of Independent States peacekeepers in Tajikistan. Um, they also had a symbolic force, about 16,000 soldiers from Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan, but essentially this was a Russian military venture. Um, they also seemed to have a bit of their own policy there. Even after Russia and Uzbekistan eventually softened on Tajikistan, there are questions over whether military elites from Russia were actually willing to give up uh, Tajikistan to Democrats at all. 70%, for example, of the 201st uh, Division voted for Zhirinovsky in 1993, back in those Russian elections. And that's significant. So they were, they were, they were on the side of ultra-nationalists. Now, you had these various conflicting interests. So Russia and Uzbekistan were essentially on the same side during the Civil War, but you did have these conflicts. The Kulabi Popular Front was supported by the Russian military. Uzbeks indirectly supported it, but they weren't happy about the prospects of Kulabis gaining power. They just wanted to help the Lenina bodies, who, were, who, who, had a, who had a significant Uzbek population. And there were clear tensions. For example, there was a Lenina body effort to oust Rachmanov in December of 1993, which the Uzbeks supported. At the same time, the Russians were actually backing Rachmanov. Same with the 1994 elections during the, for the presidency. So you had increased tensions between Russia and Uzbekistan and Central Asia at large over this issue. Um, and remember, this is at a time when the Uzbeks and other Central Asians were still worried about the, the role that Russia was going to play in their region once they'd finally achieved independence, uninvited as that independence may have been, but now uh, firmly grasped. There were increasing attempts by Central Asian states to try to internationalize this more, to get it beyond just Russia, um, to bring it into the UN and other bodies. Now, as time moves along, there's more talk of Russian imperialism, and Karimov even made some, some efforts to encourage the opposition uh, meeting with leaders, for example, in order to counter the rise of Russian-backed Kulabis. So there was this double game going on here. Now, that happens a little bit later. 
Um, now, Central Asian states frequently brokered the process by 1995. They were even growing impatient with Rachmanov, who again was elected president in uh, late 1994, because Rachmanov showed no desire to compromise, and the Central Asians wanted to see the end of this conflict. Russia was also pushing for compromise. So there's a question to what degree Russia and Uzbekistan were fighting each other um, and, and wrestling for regional hegemony as this whole conflict plays out. So in summary, this is what it was all about. It was about ending, the, the whole Tajik civil war was about ending the monopoly of political power of certain cliques that had been favored under the Soviet Union. And arguably, to a, lesser, to a lesser extent, it was also a question of what role Islam would play in the new state, where there were very few calling for Sharia law. Um, this was a stereotype used by the incumbents to garner outside support and serve as a rationale for, for the repression of the whole opposition. Um, but there was the question of what role Islam would play, as I mentioned, um, the IRP being these sort of liberal um, Islamists. So that's your, that's your general uh, take on Tajikistan. Um, so I can no longer just call it this outlier that we'll talk about later. It's now been talked about. And there you have a final picture.